This program is rated 14 plus and may contain mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome to Crime Beat. I'm Antonio Robart. Tonight, when a middle-aged man is gunned down in a Toronto parking garage, police have no idea he's one of the wealthiest men in Canada with a big heart and seemingly no enemies. There was no apparent motive here. There wasn't anything that you could point to. Uh, there was no reports of an argument or, or something that happened. With forensic teams still combing the scene for clues, police seem certain of one thing. Davis's murder wasn't a random event. We didn't know if this was a hit. It certainly had the earmarks of one. Police have released pictures taken from a security camera. The initial investigation left more questions than answers. How is a man who leads an otherwise anonymous life, how is he subject to murder? He is credited with conserving more land across Canada than anyone else. He was probably the most extraordinary and unusual person I've ever met. Here now is Mark Carcassonne with Glenn Davis, the murder of the millionaire philanthropist. May 18th, 2007 is a day that Ron Keefe, owner of the Granite Brewery in Midtown Toronto, will never, can never forget. We had uh, an order for some kegs to deliver. We were just bringing some kegs down to the parking garage to load into our van. Our van was parked right over here, and that's where we uh, just loaded them up. Then I turned around, and then just right over here, I see a body on the ground. Keith and his colleague didn't hear anything suspicious. It was obviously that he was in very bad shape. And I uh, got to the building manager's office on the first floor and called 911 from there. And then I ran up to the medical clinic upstairs to see if I could get a doctor to come down. They were looking for somebody and said, call 911. I said, I called 911. And then it wasn't long after that that we actually heard the, uh, the ambulance come. They were here very fast. They came down, the ambulance came right down here. When they took his shirt off to give him some sort of medical assistance, that's where it became obvious that he had been shot. The man in question was 66-year-old businessman Glenn Davis of Toronto. And I received a phone call just before 2 o'clock. I came to learn that a man had been shot in the underground parking lot. The man had been rushed to hospital but uh, pronounced. There was no apparent motive here. It, it, there wasn't anything that you could point to. Uh, there was no reports of an argument or, or something that happened. And the initial investigation uh, left more questions than answers. At the time, the name Glenn Davis didn't mean much to investigators. They quickly learned he was one of Canada's wealthiest and most prominent businessmen. Well-known, well-liked, and generous to a fault. I first was introduced to Glenn Davis in the course of a World Wildlife Fund trip by uh, the Duke of Edinburgh, the late Prince Philip, and I was there in my capacity as a minister's assistant. I didn't know that day how important Glenn would become in my life. Um, the, he was one of my favorite friends. He was enormously generous. And when I left being senior policy advisor to the Federal Minister of Environment, Glenn actually encouraged me to take up an offer from the Sierra Club of Canada to help them open up a national office to be the first executive director. He was probably the most extraordinary and unusual person I've ever met. My first impressions were not that positive. I, I thought, who is this ornery guy? Who, <laughs> who is this guy? I came to know Glenn personally, and, and frankly, he was a huge mentor and friend and funder for many, many years. And I think about him almost every day. Glenn was the son of a self-made millionaire, Nelson Morgan Davis. Originally from Cleveland, Nelson grew his fortune by investing in struggling and undervalued businesses, particularly during the Depression. His company, N.M. Davis Corporation, dabbled in everything from mining to real estate to trucking. By the time he passed away in 1979, it was worth more than $100 million. 
Glenn inherited the company and ran it much as his father had, but his ideas on how best to use that immense wealth began to change in June of 1983. The heavy dark smoke is characteristic of the plastic insulation as it breaks down. And that may have been just what happened with Air Canada Flight 797. He was on a business trip with uh, a longtime friend, and uh, as the plane was over Ohio, uh, the plane filled up with dense smoke. The smoke was so dense that you couldn't see the fingers in front of your own eyes. So the plane had to make a landing. And when that plane landed, which was actually a smooth landing, but obviously people were desperate and terrified because of the darkness inside that plane, um, he left through one exit and his friend left through another exit. And each one believed the other one was dead, that they had choked at the smoke and hadn't gotten out. They met on the, on the ground, and they hugged each other, they realized they were both still alive. And it certainly gave them a new appreciation on life, at that close call with death. 23 people died on that Air Canada plane, including folk singer Stan Rogers. The incident led to a slew of new Canadian airplane safety guidelines, including smoke detectors in the lavatories, which is where the fire started. It also gave Glenn Davis a new direction in life. I think that the main thing for Glenn was he had had a very narrow escape and life was short and what can I do to help um, as opposed to just generating profits for my company. He wanted to leave a legacy of conservation and supporting amateur sports. He was a competitive swimmer at the University of Western Ontario and he was an avid supporter of the women's Olympic rowing team and the University of Toronto women's basketball team. He found the cause he really cared about, which turned out to be nature conservation, and he threw himself into it. He is credited with conserving more land across Canada than anyone else, and yet he's almost completely unknown, and he wanted it to be that way. He didn't want the attention, he never sought it out, he never asked for a, a conservation area or some park to be named after him. We all stay on the road! They can't arrest us all. He would bring wilderness conservation campaigners, lots of different groups out there, Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, World Wildlife Fund, the Sierra Club, their nature conservation groups all across the country. He would bring us together to strategize. What are we going to accomplish? How do we work together? He wasn't just generous with a checkbook. He was generous with his time. Despite the millions in his bank account, those who knew, or at least knew of Glenn Davis all attest, he wasn't one to throw it around on niceties for himself or to show it off. He would go into the Toronto club in a red flannel jacket and ball cap, and all around you see all the business leaders in, in their suits. And Glenn was, Glenn almost defines the word eccentric. Those who knew him only peripherally had no clue just how much money and power he had. Even the owner of the Granite Brewery, who'd met him multiple times, had no idea. You mentioned that you thought at first he was a photographer or cameraman of some sort. Why'd you think that? He came in, he was just dressed very casually all the time. He's always carrying stuff with him, a bag of this, and he's just putting out photographs, maps on the table. I assume he was kind of one of their independent contractors or something, or photographers. So when Glenn had lunch with World Wildlife Fund executives in his pub on May 18, 2007, it seemed less than noteworthy. A typical day. But why would anyone want Glenn Davis dead? Coming up. Police go to extraordinary lengths to find a motive. Welcome back to Crime Beats. One of Canada's most prominent businessmen has been killed, and no one knows why. We now return to the murder of the millionaire philanthropist. In the underground parking lot of a midtown Toronto office building, homicide detectives were trying to find any clues they could. In those early hours, they didn't know much about their victim. No idea of his high profile. 
While we're on scene, a male by the name of um, Keith Jones um, makes himself known to perimeter officers and suggests that his boss had a meeting in that building and, and hasn't been able to connect with him and was wondering if um, something had happened. And his boss was Glenn Davis. And that's the first time I heard the name Glenn Davis. So I directed the detectives from 53 Division to have Keith Jones pick up Glenn's wife, Mary Alice Davis, and meet me at 53 Division, where I would speak with them there. I informed them that we believe that this was Glenn, that uh, we would have to go through a uh, identification of the body and that we would make those arrangements with them to go down. I realized that day that this investigation was not the usual investigation that we had been involved in in the past and that this would take some time. And I made the comment to both of them that um, this was likely to be a marathon, not a sprint. They say the first two days of a murder investigation are crucial. Two days into this one, police knew much more about Glenn Davis, but nothing more about why he was murdered and who might have done it. With forensic teams still combing the scene for clues, police seem certain of one thing. Davis's murder wasn't a random event. He was selected, like, for motive, I can't comment to motive, but he was definitely selected for this crime. Davis was walking to his car when he was shot in the chest. He died alone in the World Wildlife Fund's garage. Robbery appears to be out of the question. Others were seen walking in and out of the garage all day, yet it was Davis who was attacked. Also, police won't say if the 66-year-old millionaire's wallet was found on his body. Police have released pictures taken from a security camera. This person of interest is described as five foot eight with brown hair. Police say he appeared to be in the garage for a while around the time of the shooting. And thus far, he's the only person caught on tape they can't identify. As detectives waited for leads from the public, they launched into what Morera calls one of the most extensive background checks he's ever done in 30 plus years on the force. We interviewed close to 200 people in that investigation, some, uh, you know, very, um, prominent Canadians as well, political leaders. Our investigation took us and involved the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, a number of U.S. agencies that, that helped us uh, right across the U.S. Why is that? Why take it to the U.S.? Is that just because of his business dealings over there? Or? We involved uh, U.S. agencies because of Glenn's business dealings there and a number of different legal actions. So Glenn, being the environmentalist that he was, had bankrolled a group of lawyers who had taken a case to court against the U.S. government of all entities. And that was to fight a pipeline that they wanted to put through um, some caribou herding grounds. And that lawsuit was successful. You know, we began to look at all different options. We considered everything. We didn't know if this was a, a hit. It certainly had the earmarks of one. Glenn's wealth likely made him a target in some way but investigators couldn't find anything definitive. Glenn had a nephew who had sued him after the nephew read Peter C. Newman's book, The Canadian Establishment, in which the Davis family was recognized as one of the top 10 um, most affluent uh, 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 families in Canada. And the nephew felt that his mother's inheritance should have been much greater than it was. Glenn was successful in defending the, the lawsuit. Um, his nephew incurred uh, quite, a, quite a bit of debt as a result of, of this lawsuit, and Glenn actually paid for it and, wow. and actually gave him some money and sent him back to, to British Columbia. And he felt that his nephew had just been sold a bill of goods by, by somebody he felt who was being influenced, and he took no ill will. And, and again, that's something that reinforced who Glenn Davis was. Every thread they pulled unraveled into nothing. We thought about um, things like infidelity, uh, jealous husband or, you know, a, a family member, um, the wife m may have been involved. We, we looked at that. There was absolutely no truth in, in that. We looked at and considered, um, you know, big oil. We thought about Glenn's uh, business dealings. Did somebody um, have him uh, killed as a result of money owed? And what we discovered is that, um, you know, uh, Glenn was an above-board uh, businessman, um, a very shrewd businessman, but uh, completely above-board. If Toronto police get a single tip out of these wanted posters, they'll be ecstatic. 
it would be a welcome change. Two months to the day after millionaire philanthropist Glenn Davis was murdered, they've experienced nothing but frustration. Usually when you've got the surveillance uh, video pictures, uh, it's quite shortly afterwards that you're able to identify the people you're looking for. Glenn Davis was shot in the garage underneath the World Wildlife Fund headquarters on May 18th. Shortly after the shooting, these two men were captured on surveillance cameras walking out of the garage, and as it turns out, into obscurity. Police are certain the man with the cap is the shooter, and the man wearing the golf shirt is his accomplice. Videos have been posted on the RCMP website, and most recently on YouTube by an American environmentalist in hopes of developing leads. Davis may have been targeted because of the $100 million fortune he inherited from his father. But Davis was so private and ran in such exclusive circles, police considered his environmental activism one of the keys to solving his murder. That is one of the theories and avenues that we are following up on. Police were also following up on a previous attack against Davis, just a year and a half before his murder, in the parking lot of the family business, when he was viciously attacked. As Glenn lifted a box out of the back of his vehicle, the suspects came through the bushes with an aluminum baseball bat and began their assault. And, as luck would have it, it is roofers working on a neighboring building that observe the beating and begin to yell out and begin to make their way down from a third-story roof. The attackers got in their car and drove away. Glenn later tells uh, investigators that there is no words uttered. There's no demand for money. There's nothing said whatsoever. He just endures a beating. He had a large sum of money, often carried large sums of money on himself. He didn't use Visa, he used cash almost all the time. And this assailant didn't try to get any cash from him, didn't say anything to him, just attacked him mercilessly. And Glenn Davis was in such good shape, he survived that attack. He survived, but he, I mean, he took some serious injuries. He never was able to sort of fully regain the scope of range of motion of his arm from the shoulder injury. He had plates put into his limbs. He was extremely savagely beaten. More important than how he survived was why he was attacked in the first place. How does a man who leads an otherwise anonymous life, how is he subject to not just a beating but a murder? And so we felt like those two things had to be connected. The only connection police could make between this attack and the shooting more than a year later was that Davis attended a physio appointment to treat his injuries before his lunch with WWF officials on the day he was killed. I wish there was something at the time more obvious that we could have pointed to and said, okay, that must be it. And uh, we just really never found it until Tyler Cauley came forward. Tyler Cauley, a man with a checkered criminal past, would be the one to help police fill in the blanks on the bad attack and its connection to Glenn Davis's murder. After the break, how much does Tyler Cauley know? And will it help point police in the direction of Glenn Davis's killer? Welcome back. Faced with a stalled investigation, detectives look into a connection with the previous attack on Glenn Davis. Here now, is Mark Carcassonne. 18 months after Glenn Davis was found shot to death in a midtown Toronto parking garage, police had run down every lead and explored every theory as to why he was killed and who was responsible for it, including a previous assault with a baseball bat that left the millionaire badly injured. Despite all their work, police continued to come up empty handed. until November of 2008, when a man named Tyler Cauley entered the picture. Tyler Cauley was a young person that lived in Toronto. I would say uh, lost in his, in his ways. He was a construction worker. He uh, had a criminal record. He was involved uh, heavily with uh, uh, drug, drug use. And uh, he was, you know, kind of a person that uh, had little means and, uh, but knew certain people in Toronto uh, in, uh, that be became important in this case. How so? How does he get involved here? Typically, people that get arrested 
are interviewed by the police to see if they have information about other crimes or any information that could help an investigation anywhere in the city. Tyler Cawley at that time decided it was his time to provide some information about a, a murder case, and that was the murder of Glenn Davis. The uh, divisional investigators contacted obviously the homicide squad and said, hey, we have this guy here, he wants to talk about some information about uh, this homicide that happened two years ago. Are you guys interested? Of course, in this uh, case, we were very interested because we were at a dead end almost on, on who the suspects were, who was involved, what the motive for the murder was. And uh, we found very quickly that Tyler had information that was very relevant to this case. Stacy Gallant was brought onto the team to handle the new source. At that time, I was a designated a level two source handler, which enabled me to uh, deal with people that are willing to provide information to the police on two bases. One basis would be as a confidential source that would not have to testify in court but would provide information to us. The second would be as an agent and that's someone that becomes a witness in court. So in this particular case Tyler Colley was going to agree to become what we know as an agent. How did he connect the dots for you? Tyler outlined the attempt murder using the baseball bat that he participated in. He outlined who assisted in that um, uh, attempt murder um, on Glenn Davis. He outlined basically the motivation for it, that it was in relation to uh, the business that was owned by Marshall Ross. He was someone police had looked at earlier when they investigated Glenn's business dealings. Glenn Davis and his sister Elaine were adopted into the family by multi-millionaire businessman Nelson Morgan Davis and his wife, Eloise White. Nelson's brother Marshall and his wife, Ruth, had three daughters. Marshall would go on to marry a man named Murray Ross. The couple had two children. One of them, Marshall, was the godson of Glenn and Mary Alice Davis. By all accounts, Marshall Ross was close to the Davises growing up. He called them his aunt and uncle, though it said Glenn actually regarded and treated Marshall more like his own son. We had no children. And this relationship was so close that that's how people described it to us, father and son. As Marshall was working for Deutsche Bank uh, in the US, that he suggested to Glenn that he wanted to get married and wanted to return to uh, Canada and wanted to start a business. And Glenn, being who he is, um, told him that he would help him get a bank loan. And Marshall wanted to get into the contracting business. He wanted to renovate homes or buy homes and, and to renovate them and had a business plan uh, put together. Because Marshall lacked any experience whatsoever in uh, this field, the bank turned him down for a business loan, despite the fact that Glenn was vouching for him and, and uh, um, the bank still didn't feel comfortable. So Glenn told him not to worry about the bank, that he would himself bankroll Marshall. And so they had an agreement in place, a contract, in which um, he would make uh, $3 million available to uh, Marshall. When we began to look at the money, we uh, quickly discovered that Marshall was almost at that $3 million mark. $3 million sounds like a lot of money to, to me, but in Glenn Davis's world, it really, it's an insignificant amount of money. And given what Glenn, his past history in making other investors whole when things don't quite work out in business, we didn't see this as a motive. Marshall was also able to provide us with a schedule of repayment and a number of projects that were in the pipe and um, had laid it all out. Glenn's business partners had agreed that you know everything looked on track and they themselves didn't feel like this was any issue. Ross's company, called Rossshire Enterprises, was to pay interest at 1% a month on any amount up to a million dollars, plus 1% on any amount over a million. The loans were meant as advances to buy residential properties in Toronto and finance capital for renovations, then they'd flip them for profit. Rossshire used many contractors in its work. Roofer Tyler Colley, who admitted to attacking Glenn with a bat, was one of them. He had met some individuals on one of these construction sites and uh, he had known them for some time and they requested that he assist in basically this hit on Glenn Davis, um, providing him with uh, basically a, uh, a ride to the site where it was going to happen, the timing of when that initial beating was to take place 
and then that, that it failed, that uh, it didn't really achieve what they wanted to achieve. Uh, Glenn Davis survived it um, and, uh, and recovered from it. Kali identified Dimitri Kosserin, the owner of DK Custom Build Homes, a contractor that regularly did work on Marshall's construction projects, as the man who offered him $150,000 to kill Glenn Davis, 10000 up front, money and a mission he accepted. And Tyler told us that he had been paid to kill Glenn Davis, portrayed himself as being connected to organized crime, and Dimitri bought this, and Dimitri gave him money in order to buy a gun, except Tyler took all the money and partied with it and spent it all and really had nothing left. Tyler had no such connections. And along with uh, a unnamed co-accused, they formulated a plan in which they would take a baseball bat, an aluminum baseball bat, they cut it in half and they filled it with uh, dog food and then they taped it back together just to weigh the bat down. They then used a uh, his friend's dad's blue caravan and they began to wait for Glenn. And so they knew where to wait for Glenn because Dimitri had taken him uh, for a drive and had driven him to Glenn's home and to the office on Versailles Court and said these are two areas in which Glenn will either start his day or be at and this is where we'd like it to happen. There's a lot of information that he's telling me that no one else would know unless you're personally involved or have been told or, you know, um, we're there. Interestingly, because he wasn't robbed during the attack, Glenn had wondered at the time whether he was even the intended target. Glenn, you know, asks a rhetorical question and says, I sure hope that Marshall's been paying his guys because Glenn's original thought on the beating was that he, that these were construction workers and that somehow Marshall had been the intended target, not Glenn. Oddly enough, while Glenn speculated that he was attacked because someone wasn't paid, those behind the assault argued among themselves over payment. Tyler feels that, um, you know, he did his, his part and Glenn's not dead, that's not his problem and he wants to be paid. He approaches Dimitri and they have a big blowout in a Home Depot parking lot. And basically, Dimitri is upset that Glenn isn't dead and upset that Tyler wants the rest of the money and that he was supposed to use a gun. And during that uh, conversation, the two um, you know, threaten each other and they go their separate ways. And Tyler never speaks to Dimitri again. He continues on with his life, continues to be a roofer, and, but has an ax to grind with Dimitri. And he says 18 months later, when Glenn is killed, that he begins to read all the news accounts of what a good person Glenn Davis was. And at that moment, he begins to feel remorse. Tyler Cawley still walked away from the unsuccessful hit with an additional $10,000 on top of the down payment he partied away. His alleged accomplice was never charged. In addition to revealing the plot to kill Glenn, he also identified Evgeny, a.k.a. Eugene Vorobiov, as the man seen in and around the garage in surveillance footage the day Glenn was killed. Vorobiov was also a DK custom build contractor. Perhaps his biggest revelation? Kali also claimed Marshall Ross set it all up. Coming up. Investigators look to corroborate Cauley's claims. Welcome back. Armed with insider information, detectives look to break the case wide open. We now return to the murder of the millionaire philanthropist. Working as an agent for Toronto Police, Tyler Cawley's information was invaluable in helping them restart an essentially stalled investigation. And they had planned to use his insider knowledge to gather even more evidence when they hit a snag. He's agreeable, he's willing to participate, he's willing to help out, but then he gets arrested again and he gets put back into custody again. And uh, that kind of throws a little bit of a wrench into our investigative plan of using Tyler Cawley as an agent 
and uh, helping with the investigation from the outside. And unfortunately, this time, he's not getting bail. Not wanting to lose momentum, they needed a backup plan. Based on the information Kali gave them before his arrest, police got approval to listen in on the phone calls and meetings of key players, including Evgeny Eugene Vorobiov, Dmitry Kossarin, and Marshall Ross. They used a combination of those approved wiretaps and interviews with the suspects to piece together what happened. We had a number of conversations with uh, Dmitry Kosarin. Uh, Dmitry Kosarin, of course, was in the construction industry, worked with and for Marshall Ross. Uh, had a number of people who worked with and for him as well that ultimately became people of interest in this case. And uh, as we listened, it became very apparent that uh, Marshall Ross uh, from the Forensic Audit was provided a large sum of money by Glenn to start up a business that wasn't uh, doing very well. They also strategically planted misinformation to, as they put it, stimulate the investigation and watch how the suspects reacted. One of the most important instances of that was in a February 2009 interview with Marshall Ross. And one of the false stories they said was that the guy who they believed was the hitman was working as a roofer in Durham region and he was throwing garbage off the roof onto the neighbor's lawn and they're upset with him and they were screaming at him and they showed a picture of the hitman from the surveillance video and said we believe this is the guy who's identified on this project out in Durham region and you recognize this guy and then he kind of alluded to it that I don't know these people but he might be working for a subcontractor this I is might Ross. have hired. This is to Ross. And Marshall Ross is being shown the picture to see if he's going to come clean and say, yeah, I know, that's uh, Eugene Vorobiev. But he doesn't say he knows him. Maybe this guy is connected to this other subcontractor I use. He might know him on some site, job site somewhere. And they use that. And then he would go back and he'd make phone calls to Dmitry Kosarin and say, oh, my God, they got a picture. I got a visit from the uh, police. Uh, they were just following up from a tip that they had got like two years ago about a garbage dispute on Whitney. Which, who knows? I mean, I don't even remember Eugene being around Whitney that much. Can you remember being around? But, well, what I said, what, but then what they asked me was, can you give me a list of, of you know, job sites that you've got now? Because we just want to go talk to, you know, talk to people, see and pass around the picture. So, Basically, what I was going to do, and see if I was going to run it past you and see what you think, but I was going to be like, well, you know, someone, I mean, there was probably garbage in someone's lawn or something or other, whatever, who knows. Mm -hmm. I know Jesse was around there, but I don't remember. So anyway, I just want to get a list of places that basically these guys never worked, but, but what, that you worked on? Mm -hmm. Just give them a list. They actually go talk to people. They're going to be like, no, I don't know who the guy is. You know what I mean? And then the other way, the other thing I think I should do is, um, I mean, they're gonna, if they take, they're gonna find out there's a relationship between us, right? Well, and so I said, so I, what I was gonna do is put your name and just say, oh, well, he was in charge of the laborers. Ask, ask Dimitri. And then, and then if, if they, if they, if they, if they, if they go more, if they, if they want more, then just find some guys to talk to the police that never seen Eugene. Police could hear Marshall Ross discussing things on the phone that he told them in interviews he knew nothing about, essentially doing their work for them. The wiretap itself was one of the most successful investigations I've ever been part of, and only because Marshall was such a great witness for us. And Marshall was able to um, repeat the questions that I asked correct the thing, the misinformation that I purposely provided. And in speaking to Dimitri, they were able to lay out the entire murder for us. And as a result of that investigation, both Dimitri and uh, Marshall were able to confirm on the wiretap uh, the name Eugene and Jesse, who turned out to be Jesse Smith. So um, Eugene Vorobioff and Jesse Smith were the two people in the video. Police hadn't even been aware of the involvement of a man named Jesse Smith until it came up in wiretaps. 
They don't know you at all. But what they have to show here? Okay. Uh, yeah, it's not a great picture. But I mean, there, there is a... Is it? Oh, video. Well, they put a video of them both. Oh. From, you know, I was literally outside where the shoppers is and where the, the Granite Brewery is right there. Well, that, that door goes up and down. That's, that's where they could saw them going in and out of the parking lot. Oh, it's just saying that. Uh, no, no, it's not proof at all. Well, there's a bunch of people going in there. Yeah, but they think that they were, they, they had a time on those things, so they know that they were down there. But then just you obviously left, and then and you went back down there, and they've got Eugene walking up the ramp in from the parking garage. So they knew he was in the parking garage. Like, they think he's the guy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think he's, he's the, just he's the person of interest. They just want to talk to him. Because they think he knows who the guy is. Because they think he knows who, you know, he just didn't tell him. My head's like, <laughs> no, my head's the same way. My head's exactly the same way. Based on what they'd learned, police began to pick off the suspects one by one starting with Evgeny Eugene Vorobiov, the alleged gunman, and Dmitry Kosserin, the owner of DK Custom Build, facilitator of the plot. Police would also arrest Jesse Smith, the alleged getaway driver, a month later. Marshall, Eugene, and Dmitry had all been in various stages of travel outside of the country. The difficulty that we had is that both Dmitry and Jesse Smith, who was the getaway driver, were both married to Cuban nationals. And our worry was, despite the fact that we have an extradition treaty with Cuba, coincidentally, uh, one of the oldest extradition treaties we actually have, the fact that they were Cuban nationals may complicate their return if, in fact, that they decided to stay there. And at one point, uh, when we began to ask questions, they actually moved uh, Jesse Smith out of the country. They moved him to Cuba, where he was living, and they were sending him money there. And under the guise that Jesse would be trying to find developers to, to, to buy and develop property in there, which is very complicated in, in Cuba anyway. Um, and so it's through this third party Canadian investor that was also involved in the Cuba and Mexico deals that um, we were able to get them to ask Jesse to come back into the country. And once we had all three of them back in Canada, that's when we triggered the arrest. We, we, at that point, we had I thought a very strong case, um, and we couldn't take the risk that they would flee the jurisdiction into an area that we couldn't extradite them from. Coming up, after the break, police zero in on the mastermind behind the plot. Welcome back. By March of 2009, police have made multiple arrests, but need one more to solve the case. We now return to Mark Carcassol with the murder of the millionaire philanthropist. They knew Marshall Ross was the mastermind, and while they were busy making arrests, detectives were also stringing Ross along, hoping he'd slip up and implicate himself further. One of the last things that was going to be done was going to be a visit to his house. So we go to his house, myself and Peter Moreira, and uh, we know his wife is not home, uh, but his kids are home at the time. We knock on the door, we identify ourselves, and uh, at that time we tell him that uh, we've made an arrest, and we wanted to ask him if he knows some information about who we've arrested. So I proceed to show him a photograph, uh, a still image taken from the video uh, after the murder, and ask him if he recognizes this person. The person in that photograph, we now know to be Evgeny. And uh, he denies recognizing that person, but brings up the fact that um, uh, he knows a guy named Eugene, and Eugene works with Dimitri, but that's not him in the photograph because um, this person is bigger in the photograph than what he remembers Eugene being. I think he's scrambling now that, uh, you know, we have people that are related to him in business terms that we've now arrested one person. 
And so now he's kind of saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm sick that this would be uh, revolving around my business. You know, he talks about his own motive, that he doesn't have a motive, because why would I, why would I have a motive for this? It's, all it's done is made my business more difficult for me. My business has gone down since uh, the murder of my uh, cousin. I ask him, we might need him to come in to answer some further questions, and he indicates at that point that he's going to Mexico on Monday and won't be back till Thursday. So at that point, I pretend to get a phone call from another officer that's on the uh, investigation, and uh, I indicate to my partner that's standing there as well, I said, hey, we gotta go. Eugene, who's in jail, he wants to talk to us right now. We gotta get over to the jail and speak to him. Uh, and then uh, I tell uh, Marshal Ross, I said, okay, Marshal, we may need to talk to you a little bit later. Just uh, hang tight, we'll be in touch, and uh, we gotta go. And we leave the house. And you intentionally did that right in front of him so he would see that entire conversation happen. I was trying to motivate him at that time, almost scare him, really. Eugene's been arrested, he's in jail. I just heard that he wants to talk to the cops. What's he gonna say? I'm hoping that that's gonna put the fear into him that uh, Eugene is gonna you know, tell us everything, implicate him, and, uh, and then it's over for him. So, but at the time, I don't want him to think that he's a suspect. And you guys knew that trip to Mexico was not happening? Yeah, I don't think we were going to let that happen. I think that was already in our mind that uh, he's not leaving the country. Investigators remained in constant touch with Marshall throughout the day, building pressure, not giving him any time to think. From there, I go back to the office. We're now kind of regrouping again. And uh, I make a phone call to Marshall Ross, and I tell him a few bits of information and ask him a question. I asked him, I said, we've interviewed Eugene, and I had a question for you. Do you know uh, a roofer that was involved in the 2005 assault, that roofer being uh, Tyler Colley, do you know if he's ever worked with Eugene? Marshall Ross at that point says, well, you'd have to talk to Dimitri about that because Dimitri and Eugene work together. I don't know. And uh, so at that point, I was just dropping clues to him that we were, start, we're starting to piece things together and uh, we know certain things now. But I'm being open with him. Hey, I'm telling him everything we know. And uh, little does he know that we're doing this to provoke him, get him to speak and make phone calls and, and try and implicate himself even more. Uh, and at that point, I tell him that uh, uh, I need him to come into the police station at 32 Division uh, for a further interview at around 5.30 that day. This is all on the same day from when we met him at his house earlier that day. Marshal Ross would come in willingly and soon find himself arrested for first-degree murder. Nearly two years after Canada's preeminent wilderness philanthropist was shot to death in an underground garage, police have made three arrests in the case of 66-year-old Glenn Davis. We're not able at this point, because the case is before the courts now, to elaborate on any motive, potential motive or connections of those involved, other than, than to say that the three accused are certainly involved together. Police released this surveillance video in the days after the fatal attack. Investigators have now charged Evgeny Vorobyov and Dmitry Kozarin, both 30 from Richmond Hill, along with a third accused, 37-year-old Marshall Ross. Tell me about Marshall. Not at all. Uh, he's really nice. Um, yeah, I babysit his kids. They're always... They're just really nice people. It doesn't seem to make sense. Ross, who works as a developer, lives in this Lawrence Park home not far from where his uncle was killed. Neighbors are shocked. I've always found him just a very friendly and wonderful neighbor to have around. Marshall Ross's arrest left the family's inner circle in shock. Extended family, friends and associates were equally stunned. I thought he was so lovely and with his beautiful young wife. And I just, it's, it just, it's, it's deeply chilling. That disbelief begged so many questions. Why would Marshall Ross do this to a man who loved him like a son? What, if anything, did he stand to gain? Did police actually have a case? Perhaps the biggest question of all, who was Marshall Ross and how had he fooled so many? Join us next week for part two of the murder of the millionaire philanthropist. Marshall really believed that he was the smartest guy in the room. He had these ideas that he should be a richer man than he was. So Marshall felt like he was going to inherit uh, a lot of money. There was another side to the story, that there's a worry about Russian retribution. 
It's been suggested to me Marshall was pressured into this by the Russians. He produced a very telling piece of evidence, which was a hit list of the four people uh, Ross wanted eliminated. It's so far from my realm of reality that I can only shake my head and go so many things that I don't know about. I'm Anthony Robart. Thank you for joining us tonight on Crime Beat. Want more episodes of Crime Beat? Listen to the Crime Beat podcast now for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your favorite podcast. And for past episodes of Crime Beat, go to the Global TV app, visit globaltv.com, or check out our Crime Beat YouTube page.